there were approximately 4,000 women and girls hired at not just U.S. Radium Corporation, but a couple of other companies like it, just to paint the faces of these watches and clocks one all day. That was their a own hand job. job. A hand Word. job. <laughs> I stumbled. <laughs> History, I'd like to follow me down the rabbit hole. History, I'd like to frankly, I want to know. Welcome to HILF. History, I'd like to fuck with Dawn Brody. I'm Dawn Brody, and I am so lucky to have as my guest for this episode, my dear old ma, Lana Adams, who visited me in L.A. direct from her small town in central Wisconsin. Now, she's not a performer, has never, in fact, been on a microphone, but she's a big fan of the show and the host, of course, (laughs) and she had to do it because she was staying with me and I wouldn't feed her if she refused. (laughs) Now, her hilf subject of the Radium Girls is a fascinating and tragic tale from American labor history and had me going down some deep and winding rabbit holes that take me and mom across time, across the country, and even down memory lane to our own workplace history. And I'm so glad you're joining us. And while you're at it, join other HILF listeners and drop us a line. Over the past year, we have gotten so many great questions, suggestions, and resources that we are cooking up a mailbag episode. (laughs) Get in on it by emailing us, hilfpodcast at gmail.com, or DMing us on Instagram at hilfpodcast. It's going to be hot. (laughs) But first, a story about bad bosses and a reminder that you're never too old to have fun swearing in front of your mom. (laughs) <laughs> Let's get started. We went to Disneyland on Saturday. We went to the Tar Pits on Monday. We've given you this whirlwind tour of Los Angeles and the surrounding areas, whilst playing wildly with your four-year-old granddaughter. And now I've roped you into a podcast. Yes. This is my punishment. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a punishment at all. Yeah. Now you are, I should say, you're you're a little shy. I should I should introduce this is my mother, Lana Adams. She's not a performer. She's not a comedian. Um, I would say you have a little bit of public speaking anxiety. Does that seem oh, fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I do. Uh huh. We even whisper when we're you know on a microphone, but it's okay. You can whisper, Mom. You can't do anything wrong. You can't screw this up. You could just, you could pass out and just fart in the microphone <laughs> and it would be great. Oh, it would be wonderful. So that's the bar. <laughs> it would be wonderful. People would be like, oh my God, that was great. And they'd rewind it and they'd listen over and over and over again. Um, but I'm delighted to have you at the microphone with me, Mama. Not only because I love you, um, but because you're also a fan of history. But more specifically, you're a fan of this podcast. You're one of the few people in the world who's listened, I think, I've to every single to one. Everyone. As soon as they come out, I just stop everything else. I have people who do not know you but know me who comment on your podcast. Oh. At the YMCA. Oh, that's very exciting. On the walking trail. And they say we heard the lesbian they say, episode, they Lana. Say, I love listening to Dawn's and I say, okay. And they never say anything about the swearing. Mm-hmm. And, then, and I maybe they don't maybe they haven't heard it. <laughs> but don't do you ever find when you tell people the name of my podcast, do you say the word fuck or do you um censor yourself? No, I I no, I say it. Good. Do you kinda like having an excuse to say it? I don't need an excuse to say that. <laughs> Here's a little background on my guest. She is uh, from Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin, my hometown, as a chance would have it. Lived there uh, your whole life, but you travel a ton, especially right now. Can you just give us a list of like the last five countries that you've been to? We just came back from Italy. Mm-hmm. A year ago, I was in Spain. Um, I've been to Europe now a few times. I've been to Iceland. I've been to Australia. And I have covered coast to coast because Dawn has siblings mm-hmm. and they let me come and they say come on grandma and when we I move do. we always send her our new address so that she so can far, find us <laughs> so far they've told me where to find them and I do uh-huh. and I have some traveling companions in Wisconsin Rapids who are great fun and they like to take road trips so we've done the loop around Michigan and Wisconsin and we've done to Illinois so those aren't long trips but mm-hmm. they're 
alcoholic inducing drinks. They are. And this is one of the best things about my mom and her friends is that they know how to pack a roadie. <laughs> I didn't, I had a friend here in LA didn't know what a roadie was. Oh. I was like, how do you not know what a, well, how do you drink in the car when you're in between <laughs> bars? And they looked at me like I was a drunk. And I was like, I'm not no. a drunk. I'm just from Wisconsin. The good news is in Wisconsin, you're hardly ever far between bars. <laughs> They're true. pretty close. It's true. But you still need a roadie now and again. <laughs> what if you get a flat tire? Um, but one of the things, mom's friends, you can always count on. Mary Beth in particular, I'll call her out. Oh, good. Mary Beth always has a water bottle full of vodka on her. It's a little flask. And you don't, uh-huh. you don't have to, just, but the, the water bottle full, of, it's so much smarter because, um, A, you're sweet little old bitties. So <laughs> nobody suspects you. Me, I'm, you know, tattooed and I have this voice. And so people are like, where's the dope <laughs> druggie? We know it's on you somewhere. Whereas, you know, you guys skate right by. And even if they are going to send you through some kind of like x-ray machine, well, God darn it. They, everyone's got to stay hydrated. Wow. Leave these ladies their bottles yeah. of water. A flask. They're going to take a flask from you. Well, it's but plastic. It, l- it doesn't look like a traditional flask. It looks like a plastic <laughs> rubbing alcohol, but it's got something else. Oh, my God. It's so smart. <laughs> I, me and uh, Melby got a um, sunscreen flask plastic looks like a tropicana sunscreen thing but you can fill that i recall one of our trips together oh yeah we brought that out because that you handy. you would put your nose up to it and say does this smell right to you and then, <laughs> and then be you'd be like why is mom drink drinking tr- tropic <laughs> of the sun bum oil this is exciting um yeah so you know how to drink while you travel which i think yep. is it is important and it keeps you with a good group of travel companions um you never went to university but you read a ton and you travel a ton and i have always said that you were my first wikipedia yeah. because i always felt like i could ask you anything and you always had an answer when i when i got my period you know what happens here and i remember you flipped over a notebook <laughs> I, I mean you didn't miss a bit you flipped over a notebook and you drew what looked like a, a ram's head. Okay. And you said, these are your ovaries and this is your uterus. And once every 28 days, an egg comes down. And when a man puts his penis in your vagina, <laughs> sperm comes out and it fertilizes the egg. And I was like, oh, you know, all right there. And there I think I, I think I was probably the emissary then to the <laughs> to the middle school kids. Of, <laughs> Me at school appreciated that. Yeah. I was like, and I couldn't understand. I was like, and my mom doesn't know how to explain. I'm like, does she have no notebooks? <laughs> <laughs> Has she never seen a ram? Come on. Um, what else? What else should do if if you are meeting someone for the first time when you're when you're doing your hello, how are you? First introduction. What what else do you include about yourself? Okay, a very fortunate child. Grew up with a, a, in my own nuclear family was great, mm-hmm. and I have siblings and uh, who are all still living, which is a blessing at this ripe old age. Mm-hmm. And um, I was lucky enough to stay in Wisconsin Rapids, married a, a great guy there. He's still great. He's You're still not great married, guy. but he's still great. He's still great. So I picked a perfectly good father for you all. Mm-hmm. Well, and you. Uh, was lucky enough to work in the paper mill, which is one of the stable factories of the city and Cranberry Marsh, which I'm very proud of. And I, I have your dear friends there yet. And um, so I never felt like I needed to move, I but I love being able to travel. Mm-hmm. But I still consider that my home. Oh my gosh. Well, Rapids is an awesome, it was an awesome place to grow up. The schools are really good. Um, the trees are right now, as we record this, it is October. It mm-hmm. is just one of the most beautiful places you ever want to go. In addition to a plentitude of bars, has the single greatest bar on the face of the oh. planet, Danny Case. The, my daughters love Danny Case. We love this place. And mom goes there. She'll go there. She likes it. There's nothing wrong with Danny Case. But for some reason, for my sisters and I, when we come home, it's like there's a beaming, glowing shine from heaven that right on Danny K's, if the zombies, when the zombies come up and start hunting us down, I'm getting a shotgun and going to Danny K's. That'll be your last stand right there. It'll be worth it. (laughs) Whenever I have a guest on the show, the first thing I always ask is, what history subject do you want me to research for you? And sometimes that can be the hardest part. Not for Lana Adams. I said when you're here i think i'd like to do a podcast episode what you know in the in the spirit of that what might be some things and boy howdy you replied mom you're the best guest a plus best guest ever you replied with a nice long list of possible things that we could talk about with cited your work explained why this would be a great talk. i mean it was truly and i well, probably good. will dig into your uh suggestions for future guests so you okay. did the show a great favor um you see a tower of babel 
was a great one you suggested the history of gender identity and and how Mm -hmm. we even decided what's male and female i thought that was a fascinating subject to talk about and shooting the messenger you said "Ooh, stories about shooting the messenger stories i mean rich fabulous stuff i chose from your many wonderful suggestions the subject of the radium girls Ooh. A that's rich, a hilf. Yeah. That's a big time hilf, mom. Okay, for those of you who may be hearing about this for the first time, this is uh, the United States, 19 teens, 1920s. These were the girls who were painting glow in the dark paint for various uses and for a couple different kinds of companies, but primarily on watch faces and clock faces. Um, their employers knew the risk of radium poisoning. Um, these women, many of them got sick. Many, many of them died. Um, and despite knowing the risk, the employers suggested that they use a method called lip dip paint, which literally had them putting this radioactive paint in their mouths many, many, many times a day. The results are they get sick, they get cancer. One woman has her entire jaw fall off before she dies they sue these radium companies and after a long ridiculous litigation they ultimately win and change labor law forever the radium girls is in reference not only in general to all of these women who were employed in this way but specifically the the five to eight women that brought these lawsuits because the newspapers coined the term the radium girls and that was the headlines that they were using what was it that intrigued you or when did you first become aware of the Radium Girls? I'm a fan of NPR, mm-hmm. and it was a short, probably a book review of a, of a book written by, I'm assuming, I, I'd have to go back and look. And um, as you s- suggested, the labor practices, which employees were pretty much throwaway resources. They had plenty of them. And you say g- the girls, the women, and I, I'm assuming because they were more delicate, it was a hard job. I mean, it, it took fine motor skills. And um, when they gave the history of, and I heard it on the radio, and I thought, oh, my word. And there's a city in Illinois, I think it's Ottawa, that a lot of this stuff is still buried. Mm-hmm. It's, still, it's still in the earth. Mm-hmm. And the city knows it, and I'm sure they've done what they can, but it's still kind of ignored. Mm-hmm. Here are the resources that I will be using for the Good. the information that you're going to get um, throughout this episode. The book that I'm assuming was the source material for the mm-hmm. essay that you heard on NPR, which is just called Radium Girls by Kate Moore. It is fantastic. It is really detailed. And what I really liked about it is that it went chronologically through the history, which I appreciated because I didn't read this book cover to cover. I went to it to find source information on the company, the litigation, the background of the women. It's an excellent book. I recommend you read it. Um, There are a lot of great documentaries that also approach the story from various angles, the medical angle, the litigation angle, the um, employment angle. And then there's a lot about radium itself, why the element radium is so specific, how it specifically affects the body and its unique elements that that color the story from the beginning. Um, And there's a movie that came out in April of 2020, which you may remember April of 2020 was full (laughs) for all of us. Um, It is when the lockdown started here in LA and on many other places. And when what we know of is whether you call it the lockdown or COVID or whatever it started, right? Um, And that's when this movie came out. (laughs) Oh, bad timing. (laughs) It was really bad timing, but also really interesting because it's about sickness and and uh, work employment and how we're talking about our cr- critical workers and yeah, our crucial, you know, it's, it's interesting, uh, our essential yeah. workers, exactly. Um, it stars Joey King. It got mixed reviews. Looked good to me. I didn't see the whole thing, but uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so here is my plan for this episode, Mama. First, I'm going to just generally tell the story of the Radium Girls as we do. So you know the story. You get to meet these girls, figure out exactly what happened. Um But here's the thing, radium and radiation poisoning is really scary. But what I found more frightening in this history is the corporate fuckery that this encompasses. I mean, I think we all sort of understand greed and self-preservation. We kind of get because we all individually feel that. You see someone's got something you want, I want to go get it. 
Right. right? I want that. So it, I'm raising a kid. You've raised three, three amazing children, if I do say so myself. <laughs> oh, so well. And you know that it's tough. You got to tell a kid. I know you want that. But toy you may that not. Kid have, but you yeah. can't have it. It's not yours. And we, there's nothing wrong with wanting something someone else has. This story goes way beyond greed and self-preservation and goes firmly into get those bitches right yeah. it's about revenge there's a little bit of punishment i mean there is a level of m m maleficence in this whole business that um is pretty gross and worth talking about um and then we're going to talk about some other workplace horror stories because my research took me down so many rabbit holes that just echo this story's tenants over and over and over again um that's going to be quite a hilf so lana adams my mama Let's fuck! <laughs> Will you say it? Fuck. <laughs> that was great. Oh, I know you like saying, I know you love it when I say fuck, because I think it gives you a little jolt. I think it's it like a nice jolt. little zink up in your arm right there. How I know it's a really good podcast is when I don't hear it anymore. Actually, oh. the Houdini in the baseball was like, I don't think she said it hardly that much. And then, I, I probably didn't. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's nice. It's, I think it's important that you can you can goose your mama every now and again. Still, <laughs> get her going. Oh my god, mama, ew, get out! I'm going to start with the Industrial Revolution because it's really, as a historian, when when you're sometimes looking at these long, long threads of history, the Industrial Revolution was so recent. Okay, this is about give or take 1770s to about the 1850s is the time frame we're talking about. And generally, we're talking about the United Kingdom and Western Europe and the United States. The Industrial Revolution, we're talking steam, iron, mechanized power, textile factories, coal, waste, and mass employment right. for the first time in human history outside of agriculture and war and construction okay. right yep. so if you were going to get a gazillion men usually in an area just to work on just one thing it was agriculture war or construction right, right. all of a sudden it is a long-term never-ending it's not like war or construction where this is a project that we're doing it's just going to go and go and go and go until it's done that was new that's right and that it was drawing people to reside in these places because it was long term. So this meant you're either attracting a lot of just single unmarried men who are now living together in just employment housing that is again ongoing with no end, Change, right. or you're trying to figure out how to incorporate a new domestic reality, which is these men are bringing and or finding families and having living somewhere and then going into work and how are we going to navigate that. Uh, as soon as the Industrial Revolution started to really flex and show us what it looked like there were the critics right the humanists and the individualists mm -hmm. said from the very beginning god damn this thing whatever this thing is it abuses women and children and it turns men into working machines wow that nailed it and it nailed it <laughs> and it's the, and they also and it's just destroying our planet which they could see from the even beginning them. but we couldn't even tell by the scale of it we so it ruins a pond mm. um but in the enormous, unreal, unbelievable numbers, not only do we want the stuff that these things are making for us, we want the work. We so as unattractive as it may have been, and the humanists and the individualists were right, we just all actually wanted it. Well, it, it brought up our standards of, it was, the yeah. price was paid, but you're right. It yeah. meant people could have things. Right. Um, I mean, you look at, we have, I have this adorable little dog, Yogurt. <laughs> he was once a wolf. Way back. <laughs> <laughs> but he gave up a lot to sleep on that pillow <laughs> all day. Um, but the assumption going in, if the Industrial Revolution is creating this dynamic for the first time, the assumption, naive assumption going in is, yes, this is going to be risk. This is hard work that's going to hurt our bodies and is scary. The risk is why we get paid. That's right. They're paying us because we're working all day and we're getting hurt. And that's part of the reason why we're getting this money. And they're not going to let us die. They're not going to let us die. We're not going to kill us. Yeah. And they're not going to kill us. I'll tell you why. Two main reasons. One, they're not going to kill us because it's morally wrong. And who's just going to let a bunch of guys die? You don't do that, they especially not to your own American citizens. 
Two, even if they were willing to let us die, it wouldn't profit them in any way to to hire us to hire all these people to do a job that are keep dying, right? So, so obviously this is this is the assumption that we're all going into. But of course there is an equation, and we know that morality is part of it. But plenty of people are perfectly willing to let people die, and if it's hard for them at first to let people die, all you have to do is hire Slavs. <laughs> Hire their people that don't look enough not like them, speak enough not like them, that they can dehumanize these individuals and be more comfortable with letting them die. And as soon as that math flips, meaning if they die, it doesn't actually cost me anything more, then those two main reasons you assumed they wouldn't let you die are out the window. And this lip dip paint business was exactly that. The owners of the Radium Corporation knew exactly how dangerous this stuff was. And they told the women to lick this, the brushes, uh, dip it, lick it, and paint it because it was the fastest way. If they wiped it on a cloth, it would slow them down. So this is 100% for them. And the women agreed, we don't want to go slower by wiping this on a cloth because to. they were paid by the piece not by the hour. So the incentive is to just do it as quickly. So, the, so now you've got the corporation and the employees on the same side going, why would, why would I just decide to work slower if there's no reason? Well, and licking is kind of, if you paint it with watercolors, you do put it in your mouth. Sure. Sure. So this seemed like it a worked. Natural... It was a very delicate thing. And, uh, you know, <laughs> wild. Um, and, the, and the history of radium, nobody, the, going into this, everyone's innocent as pie. Because 1911 is when Mary Curie first discovers radium. It's why she gets her second Nobel Peace oh, Prize. Okay. So it's very new. Very new. 1911, she calls it my beautiful radium. And the reason she calls it my beautiful radium is because it glows. It glows in the dark. It glows in the dark. I still get excited when I see something glow in the dark. It's magical. It's effervescent. You can't figure out how it works. We go in the bathroom and close the door. Oh, look at it, look at it, look at it, hold it, look at it, look at it, look at it. Yeah. And, um, and so the first thing that people are doing, of course, in this industrialized age is what can we do with radium? What's the use of this glow in the dark stuff? Okay. So as luck would have it, we start World War I in 1914. And 1914 to 1918 is World War One, and boy howdy, lots of bullshit happens in World War One. It's bad. You've got chemical weapons, you've got trench warfare, you've got airplanes, you've got a just horrible, devastating landscape. And one of the worst things is these goddamn watches. Don't. Uh -huh. So what we had to tell time before World War One were pocket watches. That was it. And the problem with pocket watches, if you've ever cared, if you're trying to do, do, decide you want to be a steampunk dapper Dan one day and try a pocket watch, you're going to realize really quickly why this is a big bullshit thing to do. It hangs. It's crazy. You pull it out. You got to turn it around to figure out quickly which way is up. They broke and they you couldn't see them in the dark. Oh, they fall out of your pocket. And in World War One, we needed to know what fucking time it was. And we needed to know everybody in that trench kind of needed to know what time it was. And it had to be the correct time. Not only when to meet up with your unit, when an attack was going to happen, who, who you were going to meet up with when, and they couldn't see their watches and their watches were broken and falling out of their pockets. Two things save the watch issue. The watch band. It is the innovation of wearing your watch on your wrist. We didn't have watch bands before World War One for exactly that reason. You can't lose it. doesn't fall out of your pocket, right? And the other thing is radium glows in the dark. So now you can see your watch all the time. It's on your wrist. You can see it. So the ra U.S. Radium Corporation becomes a U.S. defense contractor. They have mined radium in Colorado and Utah, so they're mining the radium. They have hired a guy, an inventor. He figured out a way to turn it into glowing paint. Right. Great. So now the paint is called Undark, oh. and they are selling Undark paint. And they aren't the only ones who are pushing this new, amazing, glow-in-the-dark Mary Curie's beautiful radium. It is in health drinks. It is in toothpaste. It is in cosmetics to give you a beautiful glow. It was considered... Uh, a health supplement, and it was marketed on a number of platforms everywhere. And, and, and early on, and across the United States and Canada, there were approximately 4,000 women and girls hired at not just U.S. Radium Corporation, but a couple of other companies like it 
just to paint the faces of these watches and clocks one all day. That was their a own hand job. A hand work. job. I, was, I stumbled on that. You were going to say a hand <laughs> job. I heard it. I, I loved it. <laughs> now, and for these girls, hand this work. was the best job ever. You get hired as a radium girl. Are it's, you kidding me? It's kind of clean. You're with other women. You're not nervous about some jerky guy sitting next to you. Totally. Well, there's still jerk guys Behind that run you. the thing. Sure. But you're, yeah, you're with a bunch of women. The money. And you is got great. paid well, and you were independent. Uh, and you're working for the defense contractor Gosh. to help our boys overseas. And even more than that, they glowed <laughs> when they left work. I'm not kidding. Oh, of course. So one of the things, and they're told an added perk, we're not even going to charge you anything extra for glowing, ladies, you oh, lucky ducks. My. It was considered a perk of the job. Because you could go buy this radium and, you know, but you get to sit around it all day. They were painting their fingernails with it. They'd paint their teeth with it so their teeth would glow white. And some women would wear their finest evening gowns to work so that, so that when they went dancing that night, their dress would glow oh, as they spun golly. on the dance floor. Oh. First thing that they start to notice is jaw and tooth pain. So going to the dentist, teeth really hurt, had to pull one or two teeth. This is crazy. Takes forever for it to heal. Sores in my mouth. That's symptom one. Then they start to endure a disproportionately high number of miscarriages and stillbirths, which even today, a hundred years later, women don't talk about with one another. And especially then. And especially then. But they did enough to know, boy, we're all losing our babies here and in droves. Oh. In 1923, the first painter dies after mom. Her entire jaw falls off. This is so fucking nuts. She had gone to the dentist for this j jaw pain, tooth pain. There was obviously some dislocation. Her dentist has pulled so many teeth and can tell that the hinge of her jaw is loose, reaches into her mouth to feel, and her jaw comes off in his hand. Oh. And when he tries to take the, oh, like, realizes what's happened and tries to take the fragments out, it, like, turns to dust. It just crumples in his hands. Oh, my God. Um, by 1928, 50 of the women in this factory is are sick and 12 are dead. And that includes the guy who invented the paint, oh. Dr. Saban Arnold von Sakaki. Name like Sakaki, I think. <gasps> So you're a radium girl. You used to think you had all this best job in the world and you glow when you dance and everyone wants to see your beautiful teeth. Now you miscarriages and your girlfriends are dying and your teeth are bleeding and you've got cancer everywhere. There's just cancers and these women coming everywhere. So the logical assumption is, I think this radium There's might just a, be killing There could be a us. connection, yes. And here's where the fuckery really flexes. Oh. The first response from the radium corporations is it's obviously not us that are, and it's not the radium that is making you sick and killing you. All of the women who got sick and died had syphilis or some other form of VD. Now this didn't work as a strategy so well within a given employment office, but when the New Jersey girls start to hear about the Illinois girls, right? Yeah. The, Phil the, the Philadelphia girls start hearing about the New Jersey girls. They're like, I heard a bunch of girls in Pennsylvania got sick and died in their radium watch company. Are we going to get sick and die? That's when they'd say, those girls all had VD. Oh. That's what they won't tell you. All those girls went down with syphilis. Oh. So that was phase one. Phase two is, okay, they didn't all have VD because now a bunch of you, people you know are getting it. That's You're starting, right. it's not VD. It's the x-rays. They think they're sick. They go and get all these x-rays to see what's wrong with them. It's not us, it's the x-rays that are causing all of this sickness and, and death. Then, of course, phase three is the doctors see it. They look at the human body. They know they that this is cancer's it. coming from uh, uh, the mouth, right? So the doctors see it. Phase one is we bribe the doctors to not, to make Sounds it up. Sounds a say lot it like opium. Phase two <laughs> is we threaten the doctors. Um, if you can't bribe them, you threaten them. And then when that didn't work, they hid the information or they bought the information okay. that only lasts so long too right you can get, away with, that you can get away with that for a while more women are sick the women are continuing to get sick it's becoming even more apparent that it's radium you dummies that's <laughs> radiation poisoning this is bad stuff so they get lawyers to try to fight it legally 
same playbook first. We bribed the lawyers. It took them two years to even find a lawyer that would take the case because every lawyer was paid by the corporation to not represent these women. Then if you did get some young, honest buck who would take the case, they were threatened. Okay, and that will work for a while, too. I guess so. And then um, they eventually find a, a lawyer who's willing to do it, who's very accredited and bold and taking these and everything. And now the tactic is slow walk this trial long enough that they all die. And then they, they have knew, no case. They, they knew, and the reason that the corporations took this incredible line from denying anything's happening, say it's VD, say it's the x-rays, get to the doctors, get to the lawyers, now slow walk the trial was because they knew from the very, very beginning that radiation would kill because their own scientists and the corporate executives never came to the factory themselves, would only ever encounter the element with an iron apron, a wow. mask, oh, and tongs. That is knowing full well. That is knowing full well. So they slow walk this trial to the point where... Um, they're the, what the, the for several of the women the first time they make a court appearance in 1928 they are wheeled in in beds and it is a tenacious thing that they continued to push and they knew there's no saving me no and frankly even if the corporation has to pay for all of my medical bills they've only got Still, a few months right. left we know that but it was for them about principle and saving these women the that next. they had loved and been working yeah. with for all these years um it, and so I mentioned that there's various corporations, there's Illinois, there's Pennsylvania, and there's um, New Jersey. And they're, and they're on various reactions, various timelines, you know what okay. I mean? Like, it's all a little, a little bit different. But by the 1930s, it's taken seriously. There is a lawyer in New Jersey who's willing to take this all the way. He's credited, he's dedicated, he's doing the, the deal. And the radium girls, the quote unquote radium girls of the headlines are Grace Fryer, Edna Hussman, Catherine Schaub, Quinta McDonald, and Albina Larice. These were the women who technically brought that lawsuit. The company lost, and they'd lose, and they'd appeal. They'd lose again, they'd appeal. It went all the way to the Supreme Court okay. in October of 1939. The Supreme Court upheld all of the lower court's rulings. It is the eighth time they lose. They finally have to pay these fucking women. Were they still using radium? They were. They changed the practice. This was 1939 is when they finally lost. But it wasn't like the lawsuit said, so no more radium. Like, you can't use radium anymore. It was more that they were, you were liable and now you got it. So they know if you don't change your practices, you're yeah. going to be continuing to pay it so out. It so it sort of incidentally is what made them change the way they handled this stuff. And the, the it is part of the legacy of the Radium Girls is because we did continue to find a lot of really important uses for radioactive material. Okay. Um, you can label it good or bad all day, oh, but, but yeah. useful, useful, useful applications oh, for radium, sure, sure. which meant human beings needed to handle radium and handle various radioactive material from then on. And how they did it and knowledge of the risk is attributed largely to the radium girls. Because prior to this point, whatever a company needed to be responsible for for you was injury. And okay. there was a two-year statute of limitations on an occupational injury. Because okay. the idea is uh, something landed on you, you got cut, you got hurt. An injury that, you know, you can kind of... Two years is about right. Two years is about right. You probably feel it within two years. But this radiation poisoning and the effects of this radiation poisoning and, and things that can slowly erode your body was sort of a new concept when okay. it came to occupational okay. hazards. But it was that de lethal, because we are aware now of what lead poisoning will do and so on, but it takes a longer time. Yeah, yeah, right. I think it was exactly, I think the, the it was super radioactive stuff being orally oh, ingested yes. day, Multiple minute times. after minute after minute after minute. I mean, yeah, yeah. really, really bad. Not diluted, just right, straight, straight up. Yeah. Um, so that, Mom, that is part one okay. of the Radium Girls. So what we're going to do now is take a short break. Okay. Um, we're going to do three shots of whiskey each. <laughs> All right. Then we're going to arm so, wrestle for who leads it, the part two. It is afternoon. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's a perfectly civilized time. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> you stinker. The legal system is supposed to protect us equally. But if you're black, poor, 
or have a uterus, you know the courts are anything but equal. I'm appellate attorney Mary Whiteside, and in my 20 years as an attorney, I've seen how unfair the system is. On my podcast, May It Displease the Court, I chat with many legal experts like public defenders Julie Sianka. The place where the Constitution is most vulnerable to attack is when it comes to poor people. Eric Teifke. The system is riddled with racial bias. Uh, it is infected with it from arrest until the conclusion of a criminal case. And civil rights attorney Alec Karakatsanis. At every single turn in the system, there is someone powerful benefiting from how the system is operating. So grab your coffee, your tea, if you're like me. Listen on your drive or during your workout and join us as we dig deep into all the ways the legal system is unjust. Follow May It Displease the Court wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, before we go back in with mom, do the show a favor and take a moment to subscribe leave us a rating and a review. Hey, share us with your own mom. You know, it fills our sales, it flexes our algorithms, and ensures Hilf can have a glorious fucking future. <laughs> Find all the ways to review and listen on our Instagram, at Hilf Podcast. And while you're there... Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. Tell me now that you've gone through one whole half of your first ever podcast recording experience, my mama, my virgin mother. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel relieved because I know it, we have another half hour, so but it's not as all painful. So it was, I, I knew it wouldn't be painful. And I love listening to your voice. I really do. And now I get to look at your face while I'm listening to your voice. No, you're, you're, I'm learning. I'm learning a lot. I think this is so fun. You really assigned me a great subject. Like it was a joy to research. Oh, I'm so glad. I've never, I've never been assigned something that I actually didn't like. No, you embrace them all. I can tell that. I did have some that was like, hmm, I don't know where to start. But I've never um, not found myself going sort of avalanche style okay. into this stuff. It's so fascinating. And it really was an avalanche that is bringing us into part two. Oh because when you start researching labor law and you're researching, you know, workplace disasters, oh my God, girl. Too many. Ugh. Because you'd like to think, I'd like to think, I'm an optimist. I don't think people are bad. I really don't. And I still don't. Even after doing all of this research, well, like you, there's okay. bad people out there that do terrible but things. But we don't assume that every, no. We want to assume the best of people. Yeah, we do. totally. And we should. And we and should. And most of the time we're right. And most of the time we're right. That's exactly it. And, and you know that these stories are outliers. It's why I can't watch too many serial killer documentaries. Because serial killers are fascinating. I'll do an episode on some of them at some point. There's no denying. You can't pretend you don't, you don't look twice. At a serial killer, be like, what happened? Because it is intriguing. And I think that we are evolutionarily inclined to be intrigued by these things because it's good to know way back in the back of your brain. You don't need to dwell on this. But way back there in one of the creases of your brain, just hold on to the fact that some people like to skin and murder people they just meet on the street. So that if you're walking down the street and somebody seems like, God, they really think want to hurt me. You just get the there fuck out be. of there. Right. We, there's a certain warning that is prudent. Yes. And I think it's sort of similar with this. I don't think that all corporations are terrible and that every rich no. uh, entity is of trying to not. find out how to squeeze everybody. I know that. Um, but it's not bad to keep back there in the recesses of your brain that um, if it's you and your life or more money... <laughs> they get into the money sometimes. <laughs> um, here are some of the worst examples of other workplace tragedies that i came about in my okay. research this is the list is you can imagine infinitely long but these were the ones that stood out to me okay. um the breaker boys of the mm. 1860s to about the 1920s do you know anything about the no. breaker boys i feel like the breaker boys and the radium girls would have been like a wonderful <laughs> dance duet. it could have been a musical I mean. yeah if anyone does make a musical they owe me some money um <clears throat> but the breaker boys started in the uk generally these are young boys or um injured old men right okay who are breaking large pieces of coal into smaller pieces of coal 
And while they're doing that, sort of separating the less desirable pieces. So, so they are literally breaking. Things. Literally breaking. And the point is, and the reason for it, was first of all, you could charge more for coal that was already broken up because it would burn more efficiently, burn okay. hotter and more efficiently. Right. But then there became an industrial demand for coal that could burn hotter and faster. And so to have it broken up like this was really useful. Okay. But you didn't want to make it into a powder necessarily. So it was a, you needed Chunks. the fine motor skills of a young boy. You get asthma, black mm -hmm. lung, which we know a lot about from the mine workers. They were not allowed to wear gloves because they needed those little fingers. Ugh. The whole point was that your little fingers can do it quicker and you can feel these impurities and you can find them on natural crack lines and you can't do that in gloves. Uh, amputated arms left and right. These boys were um, on average eight to 12 years old. Oh. Once they were older than that, of course, they could go down into, into the, the mine with the men. But from eight to 12, you know, this was the job. So a lot of amputated arms and legs, and with some regularity, their whole bodies sucked into these huge industrial machines where they die almost instantly and their bodies are all mangled up. When this happened, mom, they would leave the bodies there until the end of the day. And they would Whoa. get the bodies out at the end of the day. Evil. So as not to have to stop all of the machinery. Huh. Holy shit, right? And the Breaker Boys became very, very active in the unions. But they were a really interesting subset of the unions because they didn't listen to any adult authority. So mm -hmm. they were sort of this uniquely um, vicious and demanding element of a miners' union. Um, that didn't listen to their own fathers because their needs were so much different. And uh, we're going to hear from the Breaker Boys again right. later on. Um, but they did fight the system and they won a lot of workplace protections um, over time. This was happening sort of at the same time as yeah. the Newsies. Yeah. If you remember the Newsboys right. strikes of the 1920s. So this is another child labor where the children themselves sort of started to organize and say, look, we want to make money. We want to help support our families. We're willing to work hard. We're willing to work long hours. We're willing to take these risks. But you got to pay us you guys take sure, care of us if we're sure. you know th there's it's we're literally not saying stop yeah but turn don't. off the machines when our bodies get sucked into it you know these seems like very basic things at the end um with the breaker boys become a, a relic of history in part because technology replaced them there okay. became cheaper <laughs> and less mouthy ways to get this coal oh. broken up the way we needed it and the way we used coal and needed coal evolved of course over time and then the other uh the other significant element of of the end to the breaker boys is, is at the hands of a specific photographer, a guy named Lewis Hines. And again, I tell you about my research rabbit hole. There's amazing pictures of these breaker boys, tragic pictures of these breaker boys, in part because of this radical photographer named Lewis Hines, who made a point of documenting some of these workplace atrocities, because so many times legislators in a perfect world are listening to the people. And yes. so you need to get legislators to be aware of these things, but they really, whether they want to or not, it's, can't act on their own. It's easier to deny it if you can't see it. It was legal. They were still hiding it. These breaker boys were hidden way, way far away where you couldn't see it because it, all you see is a bunch of children <laughs> getting their asses broken and they're dirty and they're hurt and they're humped over these stands. Nobody oh, would want it. You, you couldn't see it and not feel something, sure. right? Sure. So much like the slaughterhouses of today, it's perfectly legal to pitchfork a sick cow screaming into a meat grinder. There is no law right now that says you can't do that. I know that. But when we see, and we'll eat our burgers knowing that they're pitchforking sick cows and screaming into a meat grinder. Because whatever we're imagining, and but boy, we can't see it. <laughs> you can't see it. And they know that when you see it, you'd stop eating meat. <laughs> That's a huge problem, right? And so Lewis Hines gets these detailed, beautiful photographs of children in child labor uh, situations, and it gets on the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> and much like the book The Jungle by Upton yeah. Sinclair about the horrible working environments in the meatpacking plants, people read this work of fiction that was a collection of real things that happened, and they asked the logical question, what the fuck did this really happen? And I was like, it's happening right now. 
And they and it changed laws and it changed legislation. He also, by the way, Lewis Hines took photographs of the guys working at the top of the Empire State oh, Building. Oh, that same photographer. Those images of and he walked out on those beams to get the pictures because how else are we down there on the ground supposed to absorb what these guys are doing up there? The risks they're taking. So amazing. Um, sadly, Lewis Hines dies in poverty at sixty. It's a very tragic story of his own. His pictures were everywhere, but because he was a radical photographer to take these amazing photos and then give them away. Um, he's not making money. Well, and there's he, people who are out to get him. And were his just, no. photographs more about working people? I mean, was it like a... His... Or all kinds of people doing all kinds of things? He he never was an art photographer. There wasn't, as far as I understand, really such a thing yet. So now, a lot of his prints are, you know, 36-inch canvases you can get at, right. you know, Ikea. But... Um, no, he wasn't selling his art and having it showcased. It was just taken to give to newspapers so that okay. people would see it and it made no money. And he never found a way to make money. I don't think he was ever really employed as a proper photojournalist. And if he was, it was, you okay. know, short term okay. contracts. Another it's a tragic subject. story. Another subject. <clears throat> it is. Hilf Lewis Hines. Somebody. <laughs> what is the worst job you've ever had? Oh, I've been so lucky. Uh, you've never had a job you've hated? No. No, I've always liked my work. I think this sounds so mundane. I would think that the worst job would be just boredom. Yeah. If you had a job every day that you went, a routine like assembly line, putting something in something, eight or hours a day, you could just turn into mush just yeah. from boredom. I would think that some excitement might be not just danger excitement, but just you know, meeting new people, getting outside, getting inside, doing this, doing that. That would be the, the good stuff. Yeah, no, that, I agree. Any and job I've never I've been had. abused. You know, I've never been in a a job where people yelled at me or told me to do things, or even the customers were. Yeah, you know, no, I've been just really lucky. That's great. And you've also never had any like bad coworkers. Because sometimes if you are working in an office scenario, you're like, I like my job, I like my boss, I make good money, but that slut. Well, there've been a couple, oh. <laughs> but the, the fewer you work with, the less that's going to happen. In my last few jobs, it was me. <laughs> it was you got like, to work alone. I got to work alone. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> I, um, I've never had problems. But I think that. anytime I've had a little monotonous job like that, it is the people then that make it fun. The people that you're doing it oh, with. Absolutely. When I worked in the party store, I worked at this. Remember that five floor party store I do. in Minneapolis? I do. And we sold party favors. So if you were throwing a luau and you wanted to sprinkle your table with little pineapple cutouts we sold you thousands of pineapple cutouts you know wedding themes <laughs> balloons so there was a lot of little stuff those little poppers those little fire yeah, yeah. cracker and like a lot of retail jobs once a year you had to do inventory and you've never worked retail like that what oh. inventory day means it's kind of exciting in a sad sadomasochist way but what inventory day means is they either close the store or everybody stays and does this overnight. It starts when After the store hours. closes. Right, right. And it's all in this together. So you've got the checkers and the back, you, you know, back staffers. And you've got free cleaning. You've got everybody who is able to work comes. And you're counting. <laughs> you're just counting everything. You're separated into groups. And in our store, it was, you know how many 25s little, of these and whatever and you sit at these i mean it is monotonous stuff but it was short term you know you're doing this for one night maybe two nights and yeah everybody brings them to drink and they turn <laughs> on the music and if you were lucky you could find somebody that was fun and you, oh, it yeah. became kind of a party even sure. though it sucked so much you know but often industry will realize that you're wasting time when you're talking and laughing and taking breaks and, and we, the music it. makes everyone blah 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 so there is a, I'm sure there's an equation where ple pleasantness and efficiency fall into this perfect sure. balance and, you know. Well, they want team building and they want you to all work together, but not, not too there. much fun. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> the next awful workplace disaster story I want to tell you about, Mom, is from 1897 and it is the Pennsylvania Latimer Massacre. Just in case you think that this labor stuff is anything new, this is Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. 1897. Like, we're definitely, like, we, this is this is the part where we're getting coal. And, of course, like a lot of our workplace disasters, it involves miners. Um, but this is when 19 unarmed strikers are shot in the back by a deputized posse. 
Um, they are mostly Polish, Slavic, Lithuanian, and German. And among the really interesting elements of this story is that this mine in Pennsylvania had already a strong union presence and a lot of the workers were fighting for better pay, for safer conditions. This was one of those instances where the mine owned the housing. Yeah. So they simultaneously cut wages and raised rent. So there's a strike. So this is yet another thing that makes the workers pissed off and they start to strike. And in the 1875 and 1887, about 10 years prior to this incident, it was the English-speaking miners who struck, and it was the Polish, Slav, Lithuanian, and German immigrants who were the scabs. Oh, they came in. So the yeah. corporations brought in all of these foreign language scabs. And so in the minor population, there had been this huge schism between English-speaking miners and others, right? Okay. So they're all white. But this is the line, right, that they're drawing between each other. In 1897, they come together. Oh. These nice. old scabs and these English being, they come together because they raised the rent and lowered the fucking wages again. And they're like, we're doing this. 200 to 400, uh, 400 of them march together on September 10th. It was a Friday. They're marching because they had had this hard fought negotiation with these combined uh, miners. Now you've got the English speaking and the foreign miners. They've all gotten together. They've had these hard fought negotiations with the corporate heads and they finally got an agreement for more pay. Okay. But they weren't getting it. Their paychecks were coming and the money wasn't coming. And when they came to the corporation, they were like, yeah, we don't. They reneged. So they get 300 to 400 of these miners march in protest. They have no weapons of any kind. They get to the city center and the mining company has bribed, of course, the local law enforcement to deputize 150 fucking guys with guns. So they're now a posse. They're now on the side of the law and uh, they open fire on the crowd. Wow. And they first tried to rip an American flag out of the hands of one of the guys who was walking. And when a scuffle broke out, then they then they just opened fire. Um 19 died. They were, it was determined in an autopsy that they were all shot in the back as they tried to flee, and yet they were acquitted. Wow. And that uh. might still... Mm -hmm. I will tell you the, one of the worst employment moments I've ever had. <laughs> it was at an outdoor um, Halloween-themed haunted house okay. in outside of Minneapolis at the... Um, um, the Canterbury Downs. It was like a spooky oh. world kind of thing where they take this whole racetrack, these giant grounds, and they build like six or seven different themed Halloween houses, haunted houses. And there would be like spooky bands and costume yeah. contests. Yeah. You know, it was a Halloween theme park. And they would hire us to stand outside of these haunted houses in a somewhat spooky costume, but we didn't have to do anything spooky. Generally, they were hiring improvisers and comedians. So there was a little bit of crowd control that went beyond just giving the rules that was necessary. A little yeah. song and dance, you know. Oh, my God. You know October in Minnesota. <laughs> there's there's give or take four or five weekends. And it, could, it could be very hot or very cold and wet and yeah. glowy, you know. You're... Right. And by the end of fucking October, yeah, <laughs> it's your tits deep in winter if you're not careful. <laughs> And um, oh. it was so cold and windy and blowing. And there were like little pieces of <laughs> icy snow blowing on my face. And nobody fucking there. Nobody came. Oh, not okay? even people. So there. there's nobody to, I'm not doing my job. And behind me is one of the best haunted houses ever. And I can't go in there because it <laughs> scares me. <laughs> because if you've listened to the horror movie episode, you know that I get really scared by this stuff. And I... You don't hate really haunted want houses. <laughs> and they really, really scare me. And the reason why they scare me is because I feel like it'd be a great place for a serial killer to hide. It's oh. not because I believe the haunted house is real. It's because I think there's real serial killers who are waiting to kill people on Halloween and they're hiding in the haunted oh, for house. <laughs> so I was standing and in front of me is nothing. A cornfield, a, a recently sown cornfield. So it's just flat ground. The wind and the ice were blowing across this entire cornfield. And then seemed to come into like a V and hit me directly in the neck. And I'm just shaking and I can't leave because I need the money so bad. And, and you're on the clock. And I can't go in the haunted house. And I just had to stand there <laughs> shivering and alone and scared for like four hours. It was awful. And I, it was the worst job I've ever had. 
But your jaw did not fall off. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> oh, Mom. Oh, you did it. You got me. <laughs> Our next tragic story from the workplace. 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Oh, yes. Okay. The fire. Yeah. This was in Greenwich Village, Manhattan. The um, managers and corporate executives had locked all of the exits to prevent unauthorized breaks. Um, when the fire broke out, it between the fabric and the you know it's tight cold. spaces and all of this stuff, um, 146 people died. That would be 123 women and girls, 23 men, and of those 146 deaths, 62 of them jumped to avoid the flames. No. Fuck. Um, the very last one that I have for you, Mom, um, it's, it is kind of, I guess it technically counts as a workplace disaster, um, but I, the reason I included it is just because of the scope, <laughs> the scale. Okay. Yeah. So this is 1947. So comparatively recent to the other ones that I've talked about, it is in Texas City Industrial Disaster. The SS Grand Camp, a freighter, is parked in the port of, of uh, Texas City, and it has on board 2,200 tons of fertilizer, mm -hmm. ammonia nitrate. Mm -hmm. And at 8 a.m., a small fire starts on board, and um, the sailors are going to go put it out, and they are stopped because water would ruin the cargo. <laughs> so they are oh, dear. <laughs> apparently trying to put this fire out. By... Oh, no, let's not put out the fire. <laughs> no, oh, but we don't want to get everything all wet. And um, so the fire starts to send up this colorful smoke, because it's ammonia. <laughs> yeah, this beautiful pretty. smoke, which draws a huge crowd, oh. starts coming down to the port. At 9 a.m., the fire department arrives. And at 9.12, there's a huge explosion. This explosion, Mom. 1,000 buildings are leveled, including oil supplies uh, storage, railway depots, and hundreds of homes. 1947. 1947. The oh. workers, the bystanders, the eyewitnesses are killed instantly. By this thing. It's like an atomic bomb. I know. It is. A nearby plant employing hundreds of workers also explodes. Of the 574 people working in that plant that day, 234 of them died. Yeah. Then, <laughs> I know, this thing starts another freighter that also has ammonia nitrate on it. That shit blows up 15 hours later. And by the end of this thing, 600 people are dead. <laughs> Most of them at work. Wow. Fuck. I know. I had never heard of this. I even never heard of it. I had never heard of it in my life. And of course, it's still, recently, it is often in mines. That's where we mines hear about are, it. Yeah. Mines are still, oh, whether they're, they're on water or on land. It recently, and I'm, and I'm talking generally about the United States. I There's too many here to go anywhere. Right, right. Um, but the upper big branch mine disaster yeah. and deep water yeah those both happened in 2010 that's very recent mm -hmm. yep we remember those we remember those um and and of course then we know i think that again we understand that there's a lot of jobs that have risk and we know those jobs cops right <laughs> right there's nothing like just or right about a cop getting shot but it's different than a stand-up comedian getting shot <laughs> Right? It's different because you go, well, I'm not supposed to. Nobody tries to show well, a me. Well, policeman, a fireman, they usually have equipment. and There's training uh, and there's equipment. Now, whether or not there is a dollar amount that should correspond with putting your life at risk, it's hard to say. And one of the reasons, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because you go, okay, if you can get super hurt and die on the job, you should get more money and hazard pay. We all understand this. Makes sense. But then, like, I look at a guy towing a car off of the 405 yeah. who is laying down on his back to just real quick get this chain under the thing. And I think that that's is... as dangerous as any yes. job I've ever seen. Yeah. I watch this team of guys, you know, sawing off the uppermost branches of the tree next to the power line. And they're doing it so that these p fires don't start and the power lines go down. And I'm sure that there's something in their job, but you know, Jesus Christ, like... 
Yeah. So, you know. You're scaring me now. I know. Isn't it great? OSHA. Did that happen, kind of? Yes. In fact, if you um, go to the OSHA website, um, and I can, I'll have links to a lot of this stuff on the descriptions okay. of the podcast, um, OSHA does cite the Radium Girls okay. as one of the landmark cases that um, led to the establishment of OSHA. Okay, because what year? Let me look it up what year. I think I have it in one of my things. I just well, the things that are dangerous on the work, uh, in the workplace, like you, you mentioned, you know, knives or mines falling in or fire or something. Mm -hmm. But something almost innocuous like that, or like x-rays we mentioned, it's invisible. It doesn't hurt. Right. So we talk about going into the shoe store and having them x-ray your feet when you were a kid. They don't do that anymore. But no. that was sort of a fun thing to see the bones. And now when you go to the dentist, I mean, the gal puts on her lead apron and leaves the room. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is uh, the it looks like OSHA. The OSHA Act was signed by Nixon in 1970. Oh, that's pretty right. To your point that it was workplace injury versus things like radiation. And you go, well, it didn't hurt at the time. It's hard for me to trace it back. There are other environmental contributors that can do some of this stuff. So OSHA does define a workplace yes. injury like that as happening disproportionately to the people that are working in this area when compared to the general population. Okay. And they can statistically look at Yeah, that. and that's kind of where it in starts. In agriculture, <clears throat> certain pesticides, for instance, yes, you can use them within a controlled yeah. setting, um, but we measure the portion and, and we, we train our employees how to yeah. use the stuff. Well, and, and I think that in the future, where this logical next step seems to go for me is a psychological long-term effect from a job. Specifically, um, I think about the individuals who work at YouTube and other sorts of social mm -hmm. media companies that are the human beings responsible to bringing down violent and inappropriate content. Literally, their job is to watch awful, 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 awful depictions of child abuse and violence and rape and murder so that it doesn't go on YouTube and pop up on your Instagram feed. There is a certain amount of automation to that. The algorithms can spot certain things yeah. and they can throw them into a bucket, but they can't How block all can of those. You... So eventually a human being needs to determine if it's okay or not. How long can you be exposed to that before it Exactly. The future of this kind of conversation and how it relates to employment is going to be on the psychological side. <laughs> because much like a factory, you go, these, you know, you can't expect them to just sit down, hunched over it all, and do this stuff with their hands. It makes them sick. You can't expect them to sit over a computer and watch these images and not get sick. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. That poisons you. Sure. You know, if it doesn't. And this is where the robots or the automation non-human resources can kick in and at what point yeah they replace jobs but those are shitty jobs exactly and then the question however is because of this specific thing like radium affects your body in such a specific way especially when you're putting it in your mouth with this video content stuff you want a computer to do it to an extent but you don't want computers mm -hmm. limiting our speech right determining that a video is offensive a computer can't determine whether or not a video is offensive and it shouldn't Right. Before we wrap up this episode on Radium Girls and tragic workplace <laughs> environments, what a sad sob story we have created for our <laughs> listeners today. Um, do you have any questions or any parting words, oh, Mom? Oh, Lord. Okay. Well, I'm just so proud of you and everything you do. Oh, thank you. Everything you do. Thank you. You always make me smile. Oh, Mom, you make me smile, too. I love you. Thanks oh, wow. for coming to visit me. Thanks. I won't make you do a podcast every time every, you come, I promise. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> but you can take me to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. Bye, Mama. I, I love you. Bye-bye. Isn't she the best? I am so grateful to her and for you for joining us. We have a new Hilf episode every other Wednesday. And next time, I literally get into bed with writer and comedian Crystal Adams, who assigned me French 
literature. Oh la la. Marie Antoinette ain't the only one given head in this one. <laughs> you won't want to miss it. In the meantime, our theme song was composed and performed by Kat Perkins. A reminder that you can find my sources, links to the books, documentaries, and articles I reference in the summary of this episode, or by emailing us hilfpodcast at gmail.com or messaging us on social media at hilfpodcast. This has been Hilf. History I'd like to fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody reminding you that history is a party and everybody's coming. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>